So, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, um, which translates as may peace and the blessings and mercy of God be with all of you. I bring those greetings of peace, uh, not as a Muslim, but as a Christian um, from uh, Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Um, and uh, I, I want to begin uh, with a favorite saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Um, when he once said that uh, he, the person who cannot or does not express gratitude to his or her fellow human beings cannot possibly hope to express gratitude to God. So I really want to thank um, Australian Catholic University here in, in Canberra, especially Blue Star in the Cultural Center uh, as their partner for inviting me here today and all of you um, for, for coming. Um, I also uh, would just like to engage in my brief American version of an acknowledgement of country um, and an acknowledgement of the original custodians of this beautiful land and um, what, uh, what they teach us about um, the importance of being in relationship to one another and to the land and the kinds of things that happen when we fail to recognize that importance and the importance of maintaining the integrity of those kinds of relationships. Uh, so, uh, on to my uh, topic, and uh, I might, you know, skip over a few slides or try to go a little more quickly through so um, that we can um, move more efficiently to um, uh, Professor Johnson's uh, response and then perhaps some discussion. I, I should say that this... So, title, Which Religion Will Win? The Problem of Triumphalism in Christian-Muslim Relations. We'll see a little bit where this... I already took tipped my hand a bit, uh, referring to a title of an Atlantic Monthly uh, issue, which which we'll see um, in a moment. Um, and as for triumphalism, I, I plan to define that so you get a sense of uh, what this um, is all about. Um, I want to start with defining the problem. Um, uh, you know, when you think of the history of Christian-Muslim relations, uh, you really uh, are seeing a history of. Of, of, of conflict and cooperation from the very beginning. Um, and uh, that those terms, conflict and cooperation, are meant to really uh, uh, sort of evoke a sense of uh, historical uh, both, both tensions and, and moments of, of very real convivencia, to use the Spanish term, that existed between Christians and Muslims uh, as, as, as living, breathing communities of human beings for centuries. Um, convening universalism um, has a little more to do uh, with the ideational side of how Christians and Muslims have thought about uh, what it means to be a Christian and Muslim and have thought about their belief system. So a lot of this is, is, is going to be focused on um, our discourses about ourselves and our relationship with God and therefore with other people. So our theological discourses uh, to use some shorthand. Um, so it's one of cooperation and conflict, of harmony and dissonance. And as is the case with the cooperation, harmony, the conflict, dissonance, it's all shaped and informed by a complex interaction of socio-political and ideational factors um, involving um, contextualized power struggles, if we're going to talk about the, the conflict, um, and uh, what I'm calling here competing universalism. Competing universalism. Um, I, I, I look for an image uh, of competing universes, and, and I guess that's kind of sort of too esoteric uh, to be represented graphically, um, per, uh, perhaps even by the most uh, skilled of artists who knows, um, you know, the, the, the most sophisticated forms of cosmology. So we have two clashing galaxies there, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, what do I mean by competing uh, universalism? Well, both Christianity and Islam claim that what outsiders to these traditions consider uh, to be particular truths actually constitute universal truth, right? Um, so to put meat on the bones here, the Christian claim that all salvation is accomplished in and through Christ and Christ alone. Uh, and the Muslim claim that the Quran is the final and most definitive of all divine revelations. Uh, really, uh, what Christians are saying is uh, somehow, uh, the human connection with the ultimate, right, and therefore the universal, um, is all filtered through something very particular, and that is the life of this itinerant Jewish preacher uh, who lived in first century Palestine. 
um, and he didn't live very long uh, and didn't go very far even in his, uh, his um, peregrinations. Um, the Muslim claim that the Qur'an is the final and most definitive of all divine revelations is a great particularity there too uh, because this Qur'an was revealed to one historical individual, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, peace and blessings be upon him, and you know, uh, he also lived in a very particular time, uh, you know, and he also didn't wander very far, especially by modern standards, um, from where he was born. Um, so uh, the universal uh, and universal truth and ultimate meaning uh, is somehow found in a very particular experience. And um, uh, for people outside both of these traditions, it seems a little weird um, that there would be a claim that universal truth would somehow be mediated through something so extraordinarily particular from their perspective. Um, in light of history, Christianity, uh, especially qua mission and proclamation, and Islam, especially qua da'wah, which is a, a word in Arabic that means invitation, um, are seen by some as predatory religions. There was a conference in India not too long ago, uh, within the last decade, in which uh, it was focusing on freedom of religion. Um, and uh, some folks pointed out that freedom of religion is all well and good, but what it can mean for religions with proselytizing ethoi, uh, if we want to use that term, um, is that they get to do that wherever they go, uh, but what about those of us who belong to traditions which don't have that ethos, so we just kind of want to be left alone, you know, um, uh, with the integrity of our, of our tradition and, and our community. So it's sort of an interesting um, way of, of, of seeing Christianity and Islam, which, which I think most Christians in Islam, and Muslims, sorry, wouldn't necessarily um, uh, kind of resonate with, at least not immediately. Why predatory? Well, it's because of what I'm calling here a marriage of convenience. Um, a marriage between witness and domination. So mission and proclamation, uh, you know, they're very, they're very important uh, concepts and realities for Christians. It's the notion that, you know, Christians are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ with, his, <coughs> with many people. <coughs> because there, there, there is a life-giving uh, force in, in that good news. There's a life-transforming force. There's a resurrection life, indeed, in, 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 in all of that. Um, uh, but, you know, as we know, historically, it's been wed to the idea of Christendom. In other words, kind of, you know, the way you kind of live in to that sharing uh, the good news of Jesus Christ with the world uh, is to kind of, you know, send preachers along with conquerors, <laughs> explorers slash conquerors. Um, you know, we have this in the history of this part of the world, in the history of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and particularly the West, where I come from. This is Columbus, you know, landing in the New World, which was the Old World for the people who lived there. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but, you know, here's the, you know, the, the, the flag, and there's a banner here with the crucifix on it, and here's the preacher with the cross, and notice who he's blessing, these, these poor folk here on the margins of the image, which is quite appropriate, um, kind of cowering in fear, the savages uh, who are now going to be, and you see the darkness is here, right, and the light is with the European Christians who are coming to bring the good news of Jesus Christ, which I don't think was very good news for these folks who were basically decimated by, by genocide as, as a result of, of this process. Um, Dawa also has been wed to this concept of Dar al-Islam, or the abode of Islam. Namely that, you know, uh, look, uh, as, as Muslims were called to establish justice in the world, to see to it that the oppressed are not oppressed. And um, the light of the Quran helps us understand uh, how to live in a just society. Um, uh, that eventually got translated into, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, as we go out and, and expand territory, uh, or at least we're establishing uh, the reign of God's justice. You know, and it tends to be whenever people think they're establishing the reign of God's justice, particularly if they use coercive measures, they usually end up doing the opposite. Uh, it's not a critique of, of uh, as I hope you can see, of, of the Muslim instantiation of this. It's a critique of all instantiations, in this case both the Christian and the Muslim. 
So as modes of witness, mission, proclamation, and da'wah are essential. I mean, they really are essential to, I like to say they're part of the DNA of both traditions. This notion that there is a, a universality to the message uh, and a universality to its applicability for the liberation of, of human people. Um, so they could reach their full God-given potential. I mean, those are the ideals that are deeply embedded in the revelatory traditions of, of, of both of these uh, religions. Um, uh, but my question is, is the marriage of each to domination essential? Is that essential? I mean, that's, it's, it, 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 we, looking at history, the historical record, it appears to be. Um, but the question is, um, is it? Um, so is the problem then competing claims to universal truth, as some would suggest? So you know, you, some people are, suggest, some theologians of, 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 of religious pluralism, you know, the problem with Islam and Christianity is they won't give up on their universalist claims. That's the problem. So somehow Christians and Muslims, in order to learn to be better citizens of the world, uh, better citizens of plural societies um, need to kind of soften this universalism or realize that you know their truth is a very particular truth. That's a standard postmodern approach also to to how we understand truth to be you know to be discerned and constructed contextually in, in an almost radical way. Um, so you know, come on guys, come on Christians and gals, come on Christians, Muslims, you know, kind of get off this hobby horse of universal truth. Um, part of what stimulated this project is, you know, whether you think it's a good idea or not, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. That's part of what I mean by it's in the DNA of both the universalism of these traditions is in the DNA of these traditions. Um, uh, but I'm also thinking maybe it's not the problem. To use another metaphor, maybe we've got the wrong ogre on the bridge. Right? Um, is the problem competing claims to universal truth? Some have said yes, you know, and we need to revise these claims in some way. And I'm not going to be doing justice, I'm going to use two fingers here. Um, and um, uh, uh, they're both extremely sophisticated fingers. And what I'm saying in, in, the, in the context of this presentation is not really doing justice to the subtlety of their thought. So I apologize for that. Um, but Paul Nitter. Um, writes in, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in an essay called The Myth of Christian Uniqueness, uh, in a collection of essays entitled The Myth of Religious Superiority. Like Caesar in Rome, Christians found themselves contemplating crossing a river that appeared to be as necessary as it was full of potential risk. Given their growing awareness of both the reality and validity of other religions, Followers of Christ found it increasingly difficult to stand before the entire world and claim that theirs was the only or the best religion. Now, again, only or best, I wonder if that's, is that the same as universalism or is that something different? The religious Rubicon, we now know, runs not only through Christianity, it confronts all religions. Um, there are folks that have argued it's important to maintain these claims very strongly, these universal claims, very, very strong. Um, uh, then uh, Joseph Carter Ratzinger, eventually Pope Benedict XVI, now Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict XVI, um, he didn't write Dominus Jesus, um, but it was you know, drafted you know, kind of under his tutelage um, as head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And Dr. Shazer says the church's constant missionary proclamation is endangered today by relativistic theories which seek to justify religious pluralism not only de facto but also de jure, right? Meaning, yes, of course, we live in a religiously plural world, but is that a good thing? <laughs> you know, or, or a bad thing, or, or is it something that we need to move beyond, you know? Yeah, and you know, I think it's fair to say that for Karl Ratzinger and then Pope Benedict, you know, religious pluralism as we think of it now, not necessarily a good thing de fact, de, de jure in principle. Um, 
On the basis of such prepositions, presuppositions, certain theological proposals are developed at times presented as assertions and at times as hypotheses in which Christian revelation and the mystery of Jesus Christ and the church lose their character of absolute truth and salvific universality. Or at least shadows of doubt and uncertainty are cast upon them. I think this is an impasse, folks. Right? And I'm not sure um, we can get... I, okay, yeah, thanks. I'm not sure we can get much farther beyond this. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest is we might want to consider, just consider, reconceiving and renaming the problem. Thinking that we're looking at the wrong ogre on the bridge. Um, I'd like to suggest that triumphalism is the problem. Um, now, here's the Atlantic Monthly cover uh, from March of 2008. It's about Christian-Muslim relations in Nigeria. Know which religion will win, right? That's the ultimate triumphalist question. The notion that the universal, the, the, the universal truth value of my religion um, essentially and ultimately depends on its dominance in the world. It just does. That, that's going to be the proof, ultimate proof of the universality. When I thought of using the word triumphalism for this, I was very pleased when I went to the Oxford English Dictionary uh, I was surprised, actually, uh, that it had an ecclesiastical, uh, there was an ecclesiastical element in the definition. The sense of pride, often linked with ostentation, in the rightness and achievements of one's church, used perturbably. You know, I didn't think it was, it was going to be that specifically ecclesial, so I was kind of pleased by that. I have a different definition. SCA is me. Um, I didn't put in blue because I don't want to raise myself to the level of the OED. Um, okay. uh, the, the praxis of asserting the authenticity and oftentimes the universal truth claims of one's own religious tradition or identity by exercising the will to dominate and subjugate religious others. A praxis of asserting the authenticity and oftentimes the universal truth claims of one's own religious tradition or identity by exercising the will to dominate and subjugate religious others. And an important note here that it's actualized on a number of different levels of human experience. Um, in interpersonal relations, you can be triumphalist. Yes, subjugate and dominate and subjugate, you know, I don't just mean in political terms, right? Uh, or even necessarily, you know, communal terms. Um, even in conversation, we can attempt to dominate and subjugate others. Um, particularly if, if we have a, a power advantage over them. Um, so that you know, Christians being minoritized uh, in a Muslim majority society, or Muslims being minoritized in a Christian majority society, it can also be you know actualized on intercommunal uh, level and in an intercommunal context. So I mean it really um, as something that cuts across uh, various levels of of, of human relations. Um, by shifting the focus from the content of religious conviction to a modality of religious praxis. I'd like to propose that the difficulty becomes far less that of a collision course predetermined by conflicting truth claims, and far more of a challenge to revolutionize the manner in which religious folk live out their convictions and give witness in word and deed to what they understand to be truth. And so I just got two images here um, of kind of an icon of, of traditional triumphalism and uh, a, a kind of icon of, of, of the, the, the alternative. Um, uh, and, and they're both medieval. Um, one is Santiago Matamoros, St. James the Moorslayer, which if you go to one of the great symbols of Francism for me is the Mosque in Cordoba. Anyone here been to the Grand Mosque of Cordoba? You walk into the Grand Mosque of Cordoba, of course, there's a church in the middle of the Grand Mosque of Cordoba that was placed there in the Reconquista. To be fair, you know, before the, where the Grand Mosque of Cordoba was built was a church. <laughs> and the Muslim authorities purchased that. It purchased, I'm not sure the, the Christians had much of a choice, but that's a great gesture to compensate people, right? Not just destroy their place. Purchased the church, built the mosque, then when the Reconquista put the mosque, right, the church in the heart of the mosque, um, the mosque doesn't function anymore. Muslims to this day can't pray in that beautiful mosque. But the church is a functioning Catholic church. Um, and, to add insult to injury, all around the Catholic Church are icons and images of St. James the Moor Slayer. 
you know, and, and so here's you know the, the Christian, the great Christian iconic saintly figure, you know, trampling uh, over the frightened Moors who are being re, you know, Iberia is now reconquered in the name of Jesus Christ. A little bit oxymoronic for me, but anyway. Um, this is an icon by Brother Robert Lentz. He's a Franciscan iconographer. And this is an image of the legendary meeting between uh, St. Francis of Assisi and Sultan Medic of Ken in the early part of the 13th century. While, by the way, the uh, Crusader fleets were, were clashing with the Mamluk uh, fleets uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, Francis went along on this particular crusade because he felt the crusades were brutal and mercenary and because he actually thought, you know, what we need to do is evangelize the Muslims and bring them to Christ, uh, not kill them. Um, so, um, just to put a few more, a, 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 few, a little more flesh on the bones of what I mean by um, triumphalism, uh, I'll give some key features, I think, of triumphalist discourse and practice, and I'll run through this really quickly. Um, there's always been a close, albeit deeply ironic, relationship between Christian and Muslim triumphalism on the one hand, and at least the rhetoric of the social justice liberationist drive at the heart of each tradition on the other. So I made reference already to uh, the notion of expanding the Dharma Islam. You know, there, there's a real, there's a really good motivation behind it. It's because God wants justice to rule the world and wants to make sure that people are uh, treated um, with the dignity that He, that God, has bestowed on them. Um, and uh, you know, you, you get a similar kind of thing. Uh, in Christianity uh, by establishing the universality of Christendom. This is just a picture of uh, European colonial domination. Uh, it's, it's, it's European uh, colon, colon, colonialism in Africa circa 1920. Uh, and you know, the, the yellow is, is French territory, the, the, the pink is Italian, uh, you know, the green is British, the blue is Belgian, and so it goes on and on. And of course in North Africa, you know, uh, these are largely Muslim-majority societies. And that's not too long ago, by the way, uh, in terms of historical uh, memory and, and, and standards in general. Uh, then you have a textual aspect of this, um, a triumphalism, question mark, I'm asking is it really there in the New Testament. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Um, that's typically been used as a proof text, I would say proof text, uh, for uh, a justifying um, uh, witness, the, the inconvenient, marriage of convenience, sorry, between witness and domination. Um, you have similar uh, verses in the Quran, um, and fight those who, despite having been vouchsafed revelation aforetime, do not truly believe either in God or the last day, do not consider forbidden that which God and God's messengers have forbidden. In other words, they, they don't care about justice. They don't care about righteousness. Um, and do not follow the religion of truth, even if they are among those who have received earlier revelation. Fight them until they agree to pay the exemption tax with a willing hand after having been humbled in defeat. The only problem, so fight them until they're willing to, to, to let uh, good Muslims, you know, who have the revelation from God, you know, pledge themselves to these ideals of justice, um, and actually kind of run society and teach them what a godly society actually looks like. Um, now, uh, anyway, so let me just go on. You also have what I call inverse triumphalism, especially in the rhetoric of contemporary Christian and Muslim extremists. Your triumphalism is what forces us to activate our triumphalism and one day eliminate you as a threat to us. This is very common. So I've got uh, Pastor Terry Jones, uh, who was trying to sponsor a Burn the Quran Day to celebrate the 10th anniversary of September 11th, and uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, I guess there's some questions as to whether he's still alive, but the, the caliph, uh, or the leader of the so-called uh, Islamic State, or Daesh. This is one of my favorite uh, features of triumphalist discourse. I call it a theological fallacy. Um, the image is this example of a logical fallacy, right? Penguins are black and white, some old TV shows are black and white, therefore some penguins are old TV shows, right? It's a false syllogism. <laughs> it says underneath logic, another thing that penguins aren't very good at. I I'm sorry to all the penguins up there. Um, what's this theological fallacy? Although triumphalism may be a natural outgrowth of religious traditions with competing universal truth claims, 
If you think about it, nothing actually undermines such claims more than attempts to use them as a means of personal, cultural, and or political domination. So to put this just in interpersonal terms, right? If, if, if I'm sharing with you a truth that I believe is universal, right? And you get the sense that in some way I'm trying to dominate you with that or assimilate you, make you more like me, right? Not caring about your particularity, about the dignity of your difference. The last thing you're going to think about the truth I'm feebly attempting to witness to is that it has any universal value. It's going to seem to be just something I'm using to advance my agenda for controlling you. So it's, it's, there's a theological fallacy kind of inherent in this notion that somehow uh, a triumphalist understanding of one's faith is perfectly consonant with witness to universal truth. Um, yeah, another thing that has to be mentioned is triumphalism comes in all shapes and sizes. It's two major interdependent modalities, as I said, interpersonal, intercommunal. Um, but this is the most important point in this slide, I think. Not all expressions of triumphalism are morally equivalent. In any given social and historical context, the triumphalism of the marginalized is not the moral equivalent of the triumphalism of the powerful, right? So, you know, uh, African Americans in the United States, if you take the Nation of Islam, for instance, right, they have a kind of triumphalism, right? but, but they're speaking from a, a, a social location of extreme marginalization and historical oppression, right? No one gets hurt by their triumphalist discourse, right? And it's, 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 I'm not suggesting you know, it's excusable, ultimately, that it still has its problems, right? And we all know that the oppressed also have moral obligations, right? But they're not morally equivalent. The triumphalist discourse of the powerful is not the same as morally as the triumphalist discourse of the oppressed. So if we want to reject triumphalism, do we have alternative paradigms? Um, uh, well, I think we do. Uh, I, I think sort of philosophically or theologically, uh, I'm talking about, I, I, I have to sort of massage this language because I don't like the word emergentist, it's awful, right? An emergentist approach. This idea that, that in order for traditions to be vital, they free themselves from themselves. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but if you think about it, you know, Yaroslav Pelikan once famously said in his The Christian Tradition, um, Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Right? Um, so, as with slavery and a myriad of other issues of justice and morality, the fundamental messages of both Christianity and Islam have yet to emerge fully. And we see that in history. Right? So there was a time where both normative Christian discourse condoned slavery and normative Muslim discourse actually uh, uh, a little better than condoned slavery, regulated slavery. <laughs> I mean, you ended up having chattel slavery in the United States because there wasn't enough Christian discourse, I believe, uh, and certainly not dominant enough, uh, to say that, that, no, these people are actually human <laughs> and you can't treat them like property or animals. Right? Um, I'm not suggesting that there's any form of slavery that is good. I I'm just saying that there, you know, there are some differences there. Um, uh, but we see both traditions, you know, to have gotten beyond that point. Uh, you know, so even though classical Islamic jurisprudence has a lot of, 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 of discourse uh, that are about regulating slavery, whether the rights of slaves, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, from the very beginning, the manumission of slaves is a highly meritorious act. In fact, if you commit certain sins, it's one of the ways you can sort of uh, make reparations for those sins. So obviously from the very beginning, the ideal of giving everybody their liberty is there. Um, but now we're at a point where I, I don't know many, any Muslim scholars worth their salt, no matter where they fall on a spectrum of conservative, progressive, however you want to use those terms, who would say, you know, you know Islam condones, like, there are some, yeah, there are some, but uh, very few. And they tend to be traditionalists, right, uh, in, in, in the negative sense of, of, you know, of that term, or the, the pelican sense of that term. So we can unread triumphalist scriptural hermeneutics. Um, the Great Commission of Matthew 28, I would argue, is not about coercion, but generosity. 
It's not go out and use the gospel as a stick to beat people over the head until they accept it. Um, but it's about a willingness to share the good news of the gospel even with the Gentiles. And if you look at the Matthean, the larger context of the Matthean gospel, there's this whole theme about you go to the, the people of the covenant first, right? Don't cast your pearls before swine, right? But then there's this idea that you get to a point where particularly if the people of the covenant are not as receptive, you know, then take it to the nations, right? So I read this as don't be stingy about the gospel. Don't keep it for yourself. You know, because that's not what Jesus would want you to do. Jesus wants you to, to pour out his love to other people and to all who are willing to receive it the same way he tried to do so. And that's very different than this idea of going out and just baptizing people, making them who you are. I, I just think these are radically different uh, conceptions. Sort of tell about that verse we read from the Quran, not really about domination of the other, but as I've been mentioning, precisely the elimination of the rampant injustice and persecution that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, was called to confront and transform. So if Muslims are asking themselves, well, you know, how do I read that verse today? I would humbly suggest, I don't have to suggest this because there are many, many Muslims that read this verse precisely this way. But you know, the suggestion is that you, know, you, know, you can unread you know, uh, uh, triumphal scriptural hermeneutics in both traditions. Uh, you know what, let me, let me just skip over this stuff. Um, oh, oh, wait, wait a minute, I guess I can't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so part of this I'm reading, it's interesting, I love the notion of the triumph of the cross. Because it's oxymoronic. May I never boast, Paul writes in Galatians, except in the cross. I'm going to boast in abject humiliation and execution. You know, I'm going to boast in humility, right? Uh, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And the paradox moron, and yet the central mystery of the Christian faith is that sin and death, the true enemies of humanity, not our fellow human beings, are conquered. The conquest comes not through domination of our fellow human beings, but through self-sacrificial love, through a Um the, the title of the book, I hope, will be The Race to Goodness. Uh, an end to triumphalism, toward an end to triumphalism in Christian Muslim relations. And it comes from this incredibly beautiful verse of the Quran. Unto every one of you, uh, unto every one of you have we appointed a different law, sharp, and way of life, and hedge. And if God had so willed, he could surely have made you all one single community. But he willed it otherwise, get this, in order to test you by means of what he has vouchsafed unto you. This idea that this religious diversity itself, right? They urine, it's part of God's design. Uh, and what's the point of this? It's a test. And what's the commandment? Vie then with one another in doing good works. And to God, you all must return, and then God will make you truly understand all that on which you were wont to differ. I like to it's like hold each other's feet to the fire. Right? When Muslims see Christians not acting Christian, say, you know, that doesn't seem too Christian to me. <laughs> As I understand your tradition, I'm not trying to hold you to my standards, you know. And the Christians look at the Muslims and say, Brother, I gotta say, not very Islamic, you know, from my perspective, you know, that, that, that kind of thing, you know. Um, that's what I think the Quran is calling for, actually. And not just pointing the finger, but actually more in your own practice. Like, like, like. So, um, this verse does not deny unitary truth. In fact, its context appears to have been one of the debates Muhammad is having, presumably with Jews and Christians. It was revealed in that context. Yet the verse implicitly rejects triumphalism in favor of a paradigm of what I'd call competitive interreligious complementarity. Now it's a mouthful. Um, according to this paradigm, the only triumph is God's. Because in this race, goodness, and thus the common good, is advanced, rather than the interest of one human group over another. Just a, a Quranic prescription for intersectionality, if you want to use sort of you know contemporary limbo. And I learned a lot about this, and part of my motivation for doing this project was that I accompanied my son for four years when he was a professional triathlete 
And I know in Australia you know something about travel, so I'm glad that, you know, sometimes in the American context. And I was doge, dad and coach. Uh, and <laughs> I learned some things about the true spirit of athletic competition. This is Venus and Serena Williams. They're sisters, they're literally sisters, right? From the same parents. And they've been competing with each other all their lives. Do they love each other? Of course they do, right? You know, would they do anything for each other? I bet you they would. Are they fierce competitors on the court? Yes, they are. But they're not trying to vanquish the other. They're not trying to pull the other down so that they can be lifted up. And sometimes the victory switches, you know, between them in their long history. Why a competitive model at all? Isn't competition itself the root of triumphalism? I don't know, if we could dig a little deeper into true competition, um, we can look at the example of what was called the Iron War in Kona in 1989. The Ironman tri Triathlon, as some of you might know, is one of the world's most grueling competitions. It's a two point, sorry for the imperial uh, things here. I think it's ironic that I'm, a, I'm you know, your head of state is and you've got the metric system. And you've got the metric system. <laughs> anyway, uh, 2.4 meter swim, a mile swim, sorry, 112 mile bike ride, followed by a 26 mile run. And the best of the best do it all. It's all spread about eight hours. Um, it's replete with testosterone-laden martial imagery of conquest, domination, victory, and defeat. Right? Um, in 1989, Dave Scott was the reigning six-time champion. And Mark Allen had been at his heels metaphorically in each of those competitions. Right? But then, in 1989, he was at his heels literally. Literally. And um, I, there's, there's a YouTube video where they're both being interviewed, and in this, it, they're reflecting many years afterwards on this race. And Mark Allen won. He, in that race, he finally unseated Dave Scott. And he said this about it. He said, suddenly I was seeing the Big Island as a paradise and not as a hell, like I had the other years. So it's, it's a, a connection with, with the, the environment. I was really at that point grateful to be running with the best guy in this world. And he says that one win wasn't necessarily a legacy builder. It was just a great moment for Dave and I. You know, to have pushed each other to that extreme. Dave broke his record by 18 minutes. So Dave lost. Dave Scott lost. But he beat his own record. He's the six-time champion previously. Beat his own record by 18 minutes. Is that losing? I mean, in what book is that losing? Not in mine. That's a big chunk of time, he says. To be a part of that was such an honor. For me personally, it was like a big moment, and it really took me all year to really feel like I absorbed how amazing that race was. To me, you know, that's the true spirit of athletic competition. We make each other better. Um, leave it to women to know, to, to be able to embody this you know, in ways that men struggle with. I hate to be sexist, but that's just my perspective. Um, uh, Christy Wellington is probably the greatest triathlete ever to have lived. You don't know that because I would say she is a woman. And in most of these Ironman races, she finishes uh, ahead of many of the lead male competitors. It's considered a different race, right? But for years, when Christy Wellington was in a triathlon, all the other women knew they, they had no, she was an outlier. They just no chance of winning. So they, they, there were these moments when she'd get sick or something, and no one was rejoicing that she was sick, but it was like, now I've got a chance to win this race. Because when she was in it, no. So, uh, at, well, Leanda Cave is also a great competitor. And at one point, where Leanda's really putting the heat on Chrissy, right? Chrissy manages to pull out. And as Chrissy is passing Leanda, Chrissy's on the left, look what Leanda's doing. She's patting her on the back. This is bread and butter. There are hundreds of thousands of dollars involved in this. This is it. So wither dawa in Christian proclamation. Well, with no triumphalism, there's no predation. In light of the long and painful history and legacy of Christian and Muslim triumphalism, adherents of these two great faiths can legitimately propose them to others only in a dialogical context of mutual trust and cooperation for the common good. What I'm trying to argue here too is like, you know, this whole triumphal, they've been there, done that. Like, show me it works. It doesn't even work. 
And, and if you're really committed to sharing your faith with one another, you know, in a post-colonial, post-Shoah world, right, the only way to do that is with people who know you love them and you respect them very deeply and you have no agenda for them to be anything but what God wants them to be and that ultimately only God knows exactly what that looks like. This is the only way, I would argue, the true liberative and redemptive force of these faiths can be unleashed. It's not the end, maybe it's the beginning, inshallah. Thank you very much. Happy for you to be able to welcome Scott and to listen to him. Perhaps if I followed his example, I could begin my words by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because according to Muslim devotion, a good work which is undertaken without an outward expression of the inward intention loses half of its value. So the stimuli in this paper are so many and various that it's difficult to know where to begin or even what character my response, my answer, should take. Certainly not that of dubia, but of an engagement with what Professor Alexander has presented. However, for personal reasons, temperament, life experience and taste, I hesitate to call it a spiritual response or intellectual response, because these words might suggest a whiff of arrogance, if not triumphalism, <laughs> so that my engagement may be indirect. It is personal, it is experiential, rather than, than cerebral or theoretical. And it is its response, it springs out of my own experience of many years sharing academic interest with Muslim scholars of Islam and also sharing the welcome, the hospitality and love of many of my Muslim um, Athenian relatives who would take me to mass on a Sunday through the heavy traffic of Jakarta with huge trucks on a Honda 100 motorcycle. <laughs> Now, in what Scott says, there are many issues, many levels to be distinguished and addressed. But even the words I use, and language is such a troublesome instrument with which to express our ideas and thoughts. Even the words levels and issues represent a simplification. Because each represents a spectrum of content and emphasis. To what extent can these be subsumed in the rhetoric of the question, which religion will win? One answer to such a question, which I have heard a few years ago, is neither. <laughs> and in a hundred years' time, the only religion to remain on earth would be among an elite and it would be simply an advanced form of Buddhism. And therefore, I regret very much that Rafi is not able to be with us. Yet, the current state of the world, particularly if looked at in religious terms and from a particular perspective, and what we see so often depends on the perspective from which we look at it, Christianity and Islam in the minds of some of the protagonists on either side do appear to be in a global competition. The relationship between Islam and the West is seen in the paradigm of the West and communism. It is to the West, of course, not Christianity, in its various forms. 
although perhaps many of the religiously non-affiliated members of the rest are sufficiently ecumenically inclined to refer to the need to defend the values of the Judaic Christian tradition, which they regard as under threat. The overall picture then, I mean, is skewed. Yet, the terror perpetrated in the name of Islam, beginning in 9-11, are spectacular. They are theatrical, designed for the world stage, put on the stage by the media with multiple encores. Yet in what way, if at all, are they related to the broad church of Islam? To what extent are they a product of an involved, complex history, which Scott has indicated to us? To what extent do they flow directly and from the Quran and Hadith? Scott has also referred to this. Perhaps I shouldn't <coughs> ask too many questions, because a friend once put to me, if you talk or respond, you ask too many questions, people may think you don't know the answers to <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and perhaps I don't. But academics, by their nature, try to analyze these questions. A recent book by Olivier Gaul, Jihad and Death, the global appeal of Islamic State looks at radical movements like the Badr Meinhof gun and the environments that produce them and speaks of the instances of the Islamization of radicalism. A desire to bring down the whole of society, even if it means annihilating themselves in the process continues rebellious youths finding in Islam the paradigm of their total revolt and finding in Islam a meta-narrative in which a nihilistic revolt makes sense. But the question could be reversed. Is it Islam that has been radicalized? Is it that sporadic movements in Islam, in the history of Islam, have now occupied a place on the world stage and claim to speak for Islam as a whole. Fed in part by the spirit of Wahhabism and in part by the discovery or invention of a cosmic dimension in Islam in which every human activity has a place and that all knowledge can be, as they say, Islamized. My own arrival in the world of Islam was indirect. My first acquaintance with Muslim and with Islam in the Muslim world was at the age of 17 in my grandfather's book room when I read the Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Mm. And the Arab world took on for me a romantic hue. Then I was conscripted into the British Army. And in 1947, I was sent to British Malay. I was disappointed. I would have preferred Egypt. But it turned out to be a blessing. Southeast Asia is one of the great cultural regions of the Muslim world, long unrecognized and given the weight of the authority that it deserves. It is not a periphery, was once thought, but it is an integral part of the Muslim world, linked by the trading system of the Indian Ocean, with Sri Lanka as the chief stopping place on the way between the island of Sumatra, for example, and Saudi and Arabia. <coughs> so in Southeast Asia, in Malaya and later Indonesia, I discovered the whole range of the articulations of Islam is lived by communities of different but related ethnicities and of mixed religious traditions. In Indonesia, there are Protestant and Catholic Christianity, Buddhism and Hinduism among 
and 89% population of Muslims. The mood, the tone, the senses of openness or exclusivity, intensity of commitment and practice, they there as much as they do in the rest of the Muslim world. So it is an example of this very variety. And in it we can find instances of the most violent and arrogant to the most ecumenical. It is evident that the fondness of journalists to speak of a soft Islam in Indonesia and true Islam in the Middle East is misleading. I can tell you of my own experiences of the hostel with my students. They would tell me that in the north of Sumatra, if a church catches on fire, the Muslims will be the first to run to put it out. If the mosque catches on fire, the Christians will be among the first. And in correspondence report last night, we saw that Muslim Filipino soldiers putting their lives at risk to rescue Christian Filipinos from the ravages of ISIS. And this also tells us that although Saudi Arabia is the site of the two great shrines of Islam, and King Salman is custodian of the holy places. Saudi Arabia does not represent the best practice of Islam, and as a state or region provides little evidence of the humanistic culture of Islam that made it into a world religion, and which today, in the, in the modern literature generated in the Arab countries, produces its own questing, searching, doubtful equivalents of authors in the West, such as Graham. Muslims and non-Muslims encounter each other at a as individuals in everyday life, as friends and neighbors, as colleagues in the workplace and professions, as communities and minority and majority situations. Their self-identity is defined by religion, and religion is more a descent type than religious observance and as religion, my nation states. In my time in Indonesia among my students, I had one woman who was Christian, her mother was a Muslim, the mother gave her daughter Christmas presents. The daughter refrained from keeping a dog in respect for the feelings of her mother. In the island of Flores, we had a priest visiting here doing a PhD in anthropology, who told us that when the Muslims departed the island to make a pilgrimage, Christians in the community would see them more. If one of the number of um, Christians was, for example, going to be ordained a priest, they would attend the ordination ceremony. So there are many things that can transcend prejudice difference, sometimes even history. From Southeast Asia, I made my way to Egypt, where over many years, I was a guest of the Dominican Institute of Islamic Studies. A great event was the opening of a new library. Representatives of numerous institutions were invited. There was no doubt about the acceptance of representatives from the Islamic Al-Azhar University. Both institutions, the Azhar and the Dominican Institute, respected each other and the intellectual traditions that they shared, and the service that the library offered to the students of the Azhar. Neither of them had triumphalist tendencies. And um, there was a Jesuit guest there who talking to me over lunch one day and said that um, of the encyclical Dominus Jesus, what was 
good in it was not new, but what was new in it was not good. Yes. <laughs> but the anxiety of the Dominicans and the guests they were invited was not whether the Muslims would come and share the celebration, but whether the Orthodox Copts would come. In fact, Pope Shanula did turn out. Sometimes differences between religions can be mitigated by the passage of time. The great schism of the West was occasioned in part by the filioque clause. However, the mutual excommunications of resulting from this have now been lifted. And a copy of the John Chrysostom liturgy published in Lebanon in its printing of the Nicene Creed now has a believing in the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and then following in brackets and the Son. So that the version could serve both Western and Eastern traditions. Luther's doctrine of justification is no longer regarded as heretical by the Roman Church. Perhaps Sunni and Shia might one day return to the same conversions. In the Catholic tradition, the act, there is now a new emphasis on the awareness of God and the centrality of prayer in the cell, and an absence of condemnation of Muhammad as a first prophet. If he is not formalized, formally recognized, Prophet, at least he is a prophetic figure who fulfills in a number of ways the traditional paradigm of a prophet. This is a singular movement. I should say that this rapprochement is not universally shared. When um, a Muslim, Ismail al Barat, was invited as a lecturer in professor of Catholic and Muslim Catholic relations in, uh, in Melbourne, there were objections from uh, a particular clergyman who I think had got into with the wrong crowd of, of Maronites in the Lebanon mm -hmm. who wrote about um, the danger of the <coughs> Trojan horse. <laughs> yes. uh, I wrote um, an article for magic and theological confrontation, I forget what it's called now, saying that the objection was unfounded to uh, produce a, a rather furious and even personally directed response from a person who had no knowledge of the Middle East or of Islam but who had spoken, whose mind was um, fixated on the, con on the contrast between Mahomism and Western democracy. <coughs> this is not, of course, all on one side. Mona Siddiqui, some of you may have known of her book, Christians, Muslims and Jesus, explores, respects and emphasizes the religious meaning of the Incarnation for Christians while recognizing that this is not complete. For Christians who lay aside triumphalism, there is a need to appreciate and respect the Quran. For the non-Arabists, this is diff difficult. For there is little in English that can give its sounds and images resonance and authority. The translation by Muhammad Abdul Halim, I brought a copy in to show in fact you find where I've put it. Um, um, sorry. Is unpretentious, lucid, elegant, elegant, far from a confrontation, but rather not a spy attempts to render it using an adaptation of the languages, language of the King James Bible 
worked in a few places, but in others fall flat. If I could perhaps refer back to an example, um, Scott in I think so, uh, 229 read out, and fight those who despite having been vouchsafed revelation of war time do not truly believe either in God or the last day and do not consider what forbidden that which God and God's messenger have bidden, have for them. It could be much more easily put as fight those who do not believe in God do not believe in the last day. Those who do not declare unlawful what God and his messenger have pronounced unlawful. Those who do not abide by the law of truth. Fight them until they submit and pay the tax. This, I think, would give some idea of the force and the meaning of the words. I don't think that's the King James-ish rendering of um, which uh, Song Scott is presented here would do anything other than the puzzle. Some passages work, but in a few places, others fall flat. The person of the prophet and the Quran, if insulted, cause pain and even anger among Muslims. It's sometimes difficult for the Westerner to know why. Perhaps, by way of example, we could, might say that the text of the Quran for Muslims requires the same degree of reverence as the consecrated host in the Eucharist. It may be remembered that at the time of the Reformation, to declare that the consecrated host was just bread was a short cut to the stake with plenty of wood and a very effective accelerant. Many will remember the extraordinary demonstrations in Jakarta when the candidate mayor, a Chinese called Apa, was accused of insulting the Quran and condemned to two years in jail for blasphemy. The text was 551. Those of you who believe do not take Jews and Christians as your, and I use the Arabic word, aliyah. They are aliyah to each other. I've left the word in Arabic. It may be understood in various ways. One meaning is friends, the other allies, yet another is leaders. Some of his political opponents played the Islamic card, the triumphant card, and asserted that the verse meant that as a Christian he could not be there. For Islam would not allow a non-Muslim to have authority over Muslims. He responded they were misinterpreting the Quran for political reasons. They accused him of blasphemy. A rival political party was able to insult huge, to incite huge demonstrations. Demonstrations the mainstream Muslim parties could not restrain. However, a mainstream understanding of the verse is that after the prophets returned to Mecca, there was a breakdown in law and order. Once victory, the return to Mecca had been achieved. Alliances broke up. The verse was directed at these conditions and to meet this situation. It was a case of get behind the prophet. It was not an injunction for all Jews, for all time, and for all places, but for particular conglomerates of Jewish and Christian tribes at the time. And this contextualization is necessary for understanding such verses, as well as the position they have in the rhetorical structure of the other chapter in which they are given. Triumphalism, triumphalism. My Indonesian friends rejected. One 
in an essay, put his finger on the problem. He writes, which is the true religion? There ought only to be one religion. The reality is there are many sorts. Yet every religion has to feel that he's God's religion and that it is the one that is universal and eternal. The solution is to accept pluralism. He expresses it in rather dubious quality poetry. Theist and atheist can gather together. Muslim and Christians make jokes together. Artists and athletes can have fun together. But pluralists and anti-pluralists can never meet. A contemporary journalist and public intellectual uh, once wrote an essay critiquing the building of great and triumphant buildings. And he wrote on his village moss, not ostentatious, not committing with the houses in which it was set, clean, well kept, maintained, with minimum expense, and contrasted it with the huge Istiklal Mosque in Jakarta, one of the largest in the world visited, shown off with pride to world figures, drawing vast sums from public donations, its finances and administrators liable to corruption. Then I turn to a Muslim poet. He writes of his father, Abraham, who had two sons by different mothers, Isaac and Ismail. He says, here we squabble. Which of the two is genuine? They are both lights from a single dawn. And yet the master jeweler, God over the centuries, does not make a judgment. Rather than quarrel, he wants only like Muslim, like Moses, to be close to God on one side. Triumphalism needs to give way to dialogue, acceptance of and mutual. Respect. Triumphalism can inveigle itself into personal attitudes almost without us knowing it. The great religious edifice of the world arose out of piety and self sacrifice. Once completed, they became sources of pride. The faith became something owned by the believer, a sense of not trying to explore and follow truth by sharing its values, by living its values, but by authority over those not shared. This is what became part of the psychology that lay behind and gave moral authority to colonial. 